righty. Yeah, um, okay, so Maura, uh, why don't you take it away? Okay, great. I'm so happy to be here again, and I'll say it again. I wish it was under totally different circumstances, um, but I think just such important information is coming out every week, so thank you so much for joining us, and I have to shout out to my ARC family again, and specifically just to Leo for um, just 18 hour days right now, just working so hard. Um, I hope his wife is getting him to rest a little bit in between, but there's just seems to be such a, such a wide range of issues that um, we, we need to be jumping into. So, so my dog's gonna bark, of course. Um, anyway, I think uh, most everyone that I saw on this uh, call is already very familiar with the ARC but I just wanted to make sure everybody knows that um, we want you to stay connected to us right now because we, are, we do have a direct voice to Executive Office of Health and Human Services, to Mass Health, and we have this wonderful relationship um, with our national organization who is, is making huge strides for us on a federal level. So staying connected to us and to the ARC US will really help you understand what's happening on a local state and federal level. Um, and of course, we don't know everything that's going on. So we need to hear your, um, your feedback. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later when we talk about the finally closing our survey. Um, so again, stay, stay with us on this. Um, today, oops, I'm going to get rid of my, today we're going to um, try to, to talk um, kind of in depth about the Mass Standards of Care Advisory. I know everyone's really interested in that and a few of you I know have joined specifically to talk about um, another piece of that, which is um, related to what happens when our kids do have to go to the hospital. So. Um, Although the Mass Standards of Care Advisory is uh, focused on hospital systems and guidance during this crisis, um, that there's a piece of that that we can we can um, advocate for in terms of accommodations for our folks if they are in the hospital. But mostly, what we'll be talking about is this advisory that came out um, on Monday, and. Um, what the coalition of advocacy organizations involved from weeks back um, before this advisory came out, what we have done and what we're continuing to do and where we need, need your help. So, so we'll start with, with that. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about our mass survey response. And we closed the, um, we closed the English language survey and we kept open our Spanish and Chinese and Vietnamese, I think a little bit longer. Carrie, if I'm wrong, let me know. Um, and we'll go over uh, those responses and the actions that we've taken so far and where we see the, the gaps and where we still need to um, reach out. Um, and there's plenty, there's plenty of gaps. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, still connecting to your legislator. I just heard from um, Mike, Senator Moore this morning that he's really concerned about the same issues that, that so many of you are. And um, we'll talk more about, about staying connected to them and where we need them right now. Okay, and then if we have time, we'll do a quick DDS, DESE and Mass Health update as well. So also um, chat in your questions, but we'll try to hold most of them for the end. And Carrie, I, if you don't mind, if something comes up and it seems you know like we really need to interrupt, please let me know because I typically don't pay enough attention to the to the chat. Um, oops, I think my picture is too high on the screen. Um, I wanted to just start, you know, I can't resist ever uh, telling my own family's story. Um, but I, I did want to start with sharing a little bit and keeping it real. Um, I think of uh, that we are all in this together. And um, this is a little bit of a, a family case study because I know some of you know I have a, two kids with autism and, and a daughter 
And uh, the one who, if you can see him, he's snoozed out on the couch. Um, he's also medically complex. So I have all the same fears that you all have around, um, around his medical care during this crisis. And I just wanted to say that we are struggling, that this picture shows that he didn't sleep all night. His sleep schedule is way off with the change in his daytime schedule. Um, we're having a lot of issues with behaviors around um, food, which um, is always an issue, but when you're stuck in the house and uh, there's a lot of food in the cabinets and food hidden all over the place, it becomes much more of a struggle. Um, for my younger son, Tyler, I feel like uh, the last year, I just, I could not have been more grateful for the progress that he was making and um, the opportunities he had in front of him, including these wonderful internships that he was going to uh, daily through his school. And um, it's pretty devastating to watch him right now because he is starting to develop a lot more anxiety. I notice a lot of his OCD behavior is coming back. Um, and it's, it's crushing to me to think that he will have this period of regression um, when things were going so incredibly well for him. But Besides that, I'm grateful for their health and I'm hoping that we can make it through the next couple of weeks like all of you, um, you know, healthy and, and that's the goal. So I just thought I would share a little bit about that since so many of us can connect on these issues. Okay, so here's some more bad news. Um, in case you don't know what's happening on state level, I'm just going to quickly run through the numbers as of yesterday. So we have, you know, almost 17,000 cases confirmed and over uh, there's 433 deaths so far. Um, over 5,000 are out of quarantine and out of a monitoring situation, which I, I liked that statistic, so I grabbed that. Um, but there will be this dramatic surge, which I spelled wrong, um, until you know, they're thinking until April 20th. So as much as we can hunker down and stay safe um, the next couple of weeks. We're also getting reports from the state. There's a huge surge in unemployment and in applications um, for safety net services. So that's kind of the state of the state in general. And now I think I'm gonna jump into the crisis um, standards of care document and I, I know this is long and I thought you guys could just sort of read it. I won't read it to you um, and you'll get this PowerPoint of course after after our um, our webinar but Leo wrote this and I think um, it helps to understand what's what we're looking for in this standards of care document. So we want equity for people with disabilities and we don't want decisions being made, whether they're being made out of guidance from the state um, or split second decisions under crisis um, that, that discriminate against people with disabilities because of an underlying condition, because of an assumption around longevity of their life or around their capacity to complete activities of daily living or their cognitive capacities. So these are our, our greatest concerns that need to be clarified, um, not only in the crisis for standards of care statement or advisory, but really out to all the hospital systems um, with, with some sort of training on how unconscious bias can truly um, make a difference in assessment and treatment of our loved ones. So I wanted to make sure you guys knew the history of, of this situation. So, um, you know, weeks ago, we started seeing th that um, states around the country were putting out advisories to their hospital systems 
And um, a couple of those states were really bold in terms of what they were saying, including Alabama, who very particularly um, wrote that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities you know, should be deprioritized for, for ventilators and, and other equipment and treatment. Um, so 18 organizations came together. There were letters written um, to HHS, the governor, and out came the um, Office of Civil Rights Statement, which was really helpful because we could use that in our advocacy as well. Um, and we also wrote to the Mass Hospital Associations as well. So you can find some of our letters there. I put the links in, um, and these are coalition letters. Uh, <clears throat> what we are in the process of doing now, since on April 7th, the Massachusetts guidance came out, which we're talking about the standards, uh, the crisis standards of care. Um, we're in the process of working with a smaller number of organizations on a statement to go directly to the Attorney General and to the Secretary of Health and Human Services uh, today. Um, so when that's ready and out, we'll definitely share that. And I think um, depending on response to that, we may need to get more active in terms of our advocacy and maybe uh, lean on our, our legislature as well. We have been keeping our legislate our key people in the legislature informed, including um, the chairs of children, families, and persons with disabilities, um, thinking that we, you know, we will need them to to jump in at some point. Um, and then, if you are following the arc um, on social media, you might see today that we put out um, the the news article around a Alabama and what happened there, which is the o the Office of Civil Rights complaint was filed and um, resolved. And so Alabama was required to take down the guidance. Um, and that's a win for sure, except that we wanted to follow up to make sure that this um, sets a model for other states where just taking down the guidance is probably not enough. Hospitals need to be told explicitly um, that they can't discriminate against people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So still some work to do um, to show uh, how we're gonna get through this um, without that discrimination um, taking place. And there are other states as well. So I wrote weak resolution, but, but, but we're working on that for sure. I mean, not me personally, but there's so many great organizations working on other states right now. Um, so thinking about how you can help. Um, so at this time, I'd say the advisory is at a, a legal level. Um, we are working on influencing leaders to change, to actually change language, to reissue the advisory and to ensure equity for people with IDD. Um, however, reaching out to your legislator with some facts will arm them when and if we do need them to jump in. And um, so some of the facts that you might wanna communicate to your legislator um, is that people with underlying medical conditions should not be deprioritized, that long-term life expectancy should not be used to determine the worth of access to care, the worth of someone's access to care, um, and triage assessment tools should not look at cognitive capacity or someone's ability to complete activities of daily living. Um, and I think here I must have put the OCR bulletin, so um, you can check that out as well. So those are, I mean, there's eight points that we are reaching out to the Attorney General and HHS on, but I just kind of took the top three there. Um, and honestly, you know, if we can get our top priorities to be addressed, I think, I think we'll feel like that's a win. Um, okay, so we can come back to that with questions unless Carrie, is anybody having immediate questions? Okay, we can keep going. Um, okay, so some, some good news, I hope, you're all feeling this and hearing this and experiencing this, but um, 
DDS and DESI have been stepping up. I know I talked about this last week, but some more interesting information around what DDS flexible funds are willing to support. Um, I know we heard yesterday that they're doing um, supporting food in terms of even takeout um, because of so many of our loved ones who have real um, limited diets and um, we can't get you know, some of the foods we need delivered from grocery stores. I know I'm experiencing that. Um, so they're going forward with, with being even more flexible. Uh, we heard even some gym equipment might be, um, maybe reasonable gym equipment might be reimbursed. Um, so if you haven't reached out, or if you have reached out and you haven't uh, received additional funding or, or um, a confirmation around the funding that you need, definitely uh, keep reaching out to your, your coordinators. Um, oh, and then, and then, sorry, with, with Desi, I'm hoping that most people are, are hearing now. And I think this week was a big week to set up, um, actual virtual learning or other types of supports. I know that it's tough for some, um, of our loved ones, so many who are not part of DESI anymore, but those who are getting school services um, and maybe can't attend virtually. Um, you know, I, from my point of view, I have that situation with my son and I'm feeling like right now, the best thing I can do is stay in constant communication with his team and, um, and let them know all the issues we're facing because they are tracking trends. They are able to send visuals, send um, helpful tips to me. And, um, you know, eventually maybe we'll all be able to, to get some structure in place and, and do some specific things from his IEP. But, um, but in terms of how Desi is serving your loved one. If you guys can keep letting us know, because when we first put out our survey, there was almost nothing going on with the schools. So now we know uh, that, that services are getting put in place and we would love to hear a little bit more about your experiences with that and what's going well and what is absolutely not going well. Um, okay. So Mass Health, I know I talked about this last week, um, and I put down on the third bullet here that the hotline, and I actually can't, I don't know if Kerry, you can, you have found the hotline number, but they had announced a hotline, but I can't find it. There is an uh, ombudsman number though, and an email. So um, I will add that to this PowerPoint, and when we send it out, you'll have that um, hotline. Um, I wanted to tell you a quick story about um, how fast the turnaround was on an, on my family's uh, PCA application. So I dropped my daughter's PCA application in the mail uh, probably Monday. And uh, she received approval for my son's PCA yesterday. So I don't even know how they possibly did it that fast, but um, it was really fast turnaround and so helpful given she is doing just amazing amounts of, of work with my son um, while we're home together. So if you have that option, it's definitely worth doing temporarily um, with any family member that's helping out. Um, and then some more telehealth guidance came out around ABA, PT, OT and speech. Um, and again, same situations. If you're having problems, please reach out to us um, and let us know. We need your voice. And the last thing we've been advocating for um, pretty consistently is to let guardians be PCAs and also to try to wiggle the waivers at this point in time to allow for prompting and queuing. And that's, you know, two things that we've been working on for a long time. There are actually bills that are out there in the legislature right now. So fingers crossed, and maybe we will do some CQ, some letters for you guys to send um, around this issue. Seems like something they could do temporarily at least to ease the burden. Um, okay, just going quickly through some of the things that have come out this week on group homes. Um, I know you all heard um, about the tragedies at the Holyoke Soldiers Home and in that happening, 
um, with the AG investigating, um, our, some of our group homes and residential settings are getting a little more attention. So that's a good thing. Epidemiologists are being assigned to the group homes in some situations. Um, there's some mobile testing available um, so people don't have to leave. And for the providers, there's some reimbursement issues that are getting clarified. And if there's professionals on this webinar who are more interested in that, I'm sure, um, you know, ADDP has put out some good guidance on that. And uh, we also have some, so reach out and I can send that along. Um, the other issues which we talked about last time were the, the people who are living independently and, and semi-independently and the isolation. And we're hearing that across the board, but as you can imagine, those those who are living alone um, with very little uh, supports, it's, it's even more intense. Um, and then the threat to our workforce. So we'll be doing some, I think we're gonna be really tr focusing on, on the workforce in um, the next couple of weeks on trying to figure out ways to support them as they are often quarantined and, um, and hopefully by now getting the PPE equipment that they need, but just doing some good ways, some ways that we can support them. So stay tuned for that. Uh, so talking about connecting with your legislators, I know I mentioned that, and we talked about definitely uh, filling them in on the mass um, crisis standards of care issues. And one of the issues which I didn't bring up is this problem of um, a, how are we going to accommodate people with disabilities in the hospital setting, in triage and in ICU or as an inpatient, um, because currently there is um, certainly gu guidelines and regulations that don't allow parents or guardians to accompany um, their child or adult into uh, triage and ICU. Although we've heard of exceptions at certain hospitals, for sure, we would really like the crisis standards of care document to outline that. So that's part of what we're going to be asking. We've also put this in writing now multiple times um, to HHS and DDS, for sure. Um, to remind them how important it is that someone um, who is nonverbal or low verbal or high anxiety, um, behavioral, any of those issues that we can support them um, during such a scary time. So that's something to definitely bring to your legislator. Um, the, the three areas about the CSC are really, we can't, allow rationed care based on these underlying medical conditions or projected life expectancy or cognitive capacity or skill level um, that is stable. So tell your story. This is the time. This is definitely your time to tell about the value of your loved one. We're fighting against a bias that's pretty deeply embedded. Um, and we need to tell people how important um, our loved ones really are and how important it is for our entire disability community to be supported right now, um, support in our group homes for families. Um, we need more crisis planning in our government affairs meeting on Monday, it came up. Um, what about if a parent caregiver gets sick and they have someone with profound disabilities at home? Um, we need we need our state agencies to, to be able to give us crisis planning around that. Um, so all those things are in play. We're working with, with leadership on all of those things. And again, um, hoping that we can get in the parents as guardians and the PCA exceptions to prompting and queuing because of the eminent need. Uh, let's see, okay. So just turning a little bit over to what's happening in the state legislature. They're still working, the budget still must proceed. It's a $44 billion budget and we're in unprecedented times and it requires them to have unprecedented solutions. I know they tried to have a formal session. Um, technology, I think is a huge issue at the state house. So, um, you know, scrambling to, to, to make things happen and keep things moving forward. I know they're looking at eliminating 
MCAS requirements. Um, they were supposed to meet an education funding reform deadline on the huge education reform bill of April 1st, and they have a bill to kind of give them an extension on that. That's a, I think, $1.5 billion bill. So we're really concerned about how those funds are gonna um, be available in the coming year. Uh, I mentioned the AG investigating and bringing a t a closer attention to our group homes. And um, there was also legislation um, brought forth by the governor to waive liability of frontline healthcare workers given some of the environments that they're gonna be working in. So those are just a few snippets of what's been going on the last couple of days. Um, and there's plenty more. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to talk about is really our um, survey and what's been coming back to us. And I thought it was interesting taking the, the words that are, were used most often in the comments section from all of you and, and making the, the, word, the word puzzle or oh, I don't know what they call this word collage. Um, a lot of people are talking about their mental health, the mental health of their loved ones, um, loneliness, lack of structure. Um, but as we turn and look at um, our uh, survey that we haven't closed yet, but we start to look at for families who speak different languages, um, some of the words that are coming out, and I will certainly do another uh, collage when we close that survey, are, are things like uh, food supply and um, poverty and fear. Um, and, uh, you know, we're hearing about behavioral challenges and psychiatric crises and depression. Um, so finances, um, as you can see, it's kind of all, uh, all summed up in, um, in fear and uncertainty. So uh, in terms of what the ARC is doing, we are uh, really trying to address those issues of, um, that came up on the survey of, of about 27% of you feeling like your basic needs maybe aren't met or are not met. And I think that's a, that's a huge number. Um, so that tells us really to back up and, and make sure that our safety net services are in place and people have access to that and that they feel that, um, you know, that their food supply is there. Um, and so reaching out to our family support centers and um, making sure they're reaching all families that they can reach. But honestly, and I said this last time, um, if you're in that place and you feel like you are um, really, the barriers are really great, please reach out to me directly and, um, and to the ARC at any time. So there's so much more to talk about around the survey, but I know we're getting close to the end. Um, and I definitely wanted to leave some time for questions. And I just also wanted to say that um, I heard someone say this, and I think that, you know, it's a good reminder that we are all really brave um, in this community. And um, being brave doesn't mean that you uh, don't feel fear. It just means that you keep on doing the next right thing. And that's what we're all trying to do. And again, we're all here to do it uh, together. So thank you for connecting today. And um, we can open it up to questions. Everybody's muted though. Carrie, are you there? Hmm. Hey, Maura. There you are, yay. I'm, I'm, I'm unmuted. Um, this is Mary Woodward, how are you? Hi, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see Hanging you. In there. <laughs> thanks for being here. Oh, thanks. Um, I had a quick question. Um, I'm really concerned because Christopher, my son, is going to turn 18 in July. 
Um, and so we had started his guardianship process um, in terms of like the evals and all of that stuff. And we're working with an attorney. Oh, yeah. But I know like the, the Middlesex courts are closed. I'm sure all the courts are closed. And I'm just concerned that we don't get his guardianship in place. And then he gets sick and he has to go into a hospital and I'm not even his guardian. And it's scaring me to death. I mean, among all the other millions of things that are scaring me to death, but absolutely, you know, I just, I don't even know what to do. Is that something that I should be seriously worried about or? Um, so Mary, I would say that currently, even when you have a guardianship, there's still concerns around whether you're going to be able to accompany your loved one. This is where we're at right now in terms of trying to advocate for these accommodations for people with disabilities. So I, my feeling is um, everyone's in the same boat right now. Okay. And what I've been trying to do and, you know, until we get some sort of resolution or accommodation that we can go out and clearly communicate um, to, to all hospital systems is uh, trying to work with my own medical team um, and get a plan, a really clear plan from them. Um, like I got a great plan from Neil's epileptologist yesterday on how we could manage him at home if he did get sick and try to um, he prescribed some medication for to, to really ensure that he wouldn't have a seizure while he was sick. And so, so trying to get, you know, connected to, to do planning in advance. And, and my pediatrician has been wonderful around um, uh, where he thinks, you know, the, the best place to go get tested, the best place to go get care, and, you know, maybe not into Boston right now. And, okay. uh, and then the other little piece of good news, I don't know, just hopeful news is, um, you know, it's the younger population, and I, this is more antidotal from my doctor, but you know, they truly are not getting hit so hard. Um, right. We have what I think yesterday, we had 289 adults on ventilators at Mass General and zero children. Okay. And then at Children's Hospital, I believe there were only about 12 kids on ventilators yesterday. Um, so I felt like, well, that, you know, of course, our kids are getting older and older and more into that age where they're, they're not children anymore. But I think the younger folks are, are, are um, you know, slightly less at risk. And that can make us feel a little bit of relief. But I know there's plenty of us with older folks as well. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I, I probably will. I hadn't actually reached out to his pediatrician, so that's good advice. Maybe I'll do yeah. that. And and we'll yeah, let you know. I'm not feeling of control. <laughs> right. I know. And we'll let you know about what happens with these accommodations that we're requesting to HHS and DDS and um, and through the standards of care document. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, Laura, this is Carrie. Sorry, I had some problems unmuting myself, but I'm, I, I think you can hear me now. Um, yeah. Melissa had a question. Um, is the response to the CSC going to include reallocating personal equipment? And can we please have a triage officer for disability? Yeah, so I, I like both of those ideas. Right now, the standards of care does not talk about uh, PPE equipment. It's the document is specifically around crisis intervention for hospitals during this pandemic, um, and I believe that the PPE is probably just in a whole other you know, set of yeah, I was referring more to the ventilators. I've heard of them taking ventilators from individuals or talking about that in other states. Somebody's personal ventilator goes into yeah. the hospital, like reallocating that. That 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 is in there. Okay. So yeah, sorry. So I thought you meant PP um, masks. I don't know why I think of that. But yeah, so there is a section and we are addressing it. It's one of the eight topics I was talking about um, around um, reallocation of ventilators definitely definitely okay thanks and uh, Beth had a, a, a question um, is DDS learning from the devastating experiences at group homes in New York City I guess there's an article in the New York Times about this yeah 
You know, I, I think so. I, I mentioned that we uh, have started to see epidemiologists coming out. We started to see mobile testing coming out, um, PPE equipment getting out to group home. Uh, you know, the fact that they were um, deemed essential uh, allowed us to get that equipment out faster. Um, but everything's happening so quickly as we, as we move into the surge. I think we can only, I think our provider agencies are doing a great job trying to uh, uh, advocate for their staff. And, um, you know, yeah, I think we're, we're in a place where we could always do more for those, for those organizations right now and for our, our loved ones. Okay, um, thank you. All righty. Um, let's see, we're going down the list of the questions. Um, Carrie, this Carol is Holland. Yeah. Oh. Does, does Carol Holland want to um, yeah, unmute is, herself? She is. She's good. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Carol, my legal name is Carol, but this is Carrie Holland, Bobby's mom. So um, my big push is on titer slash antibody testing. And there's been all kinds of talk and articles back and forth. But I know actually personally, I have two family members who tested positive, and one of them is the scientist at Abbott Labs who's wor working on the titer tests right now. So I know that they're coming, and I'm asking, can we please prioritize our community first in line because we're the most at risk? And I'm terrified about sending Bobby back to school. Um, we have had no home care for probably six months anyway, um, just for staffing issues, and now it's nothing. And uh -huh. Um, it's, it's absolutely available. Um, there are non-scientists weighing in on whether or not it'll be effective. I'm certain that the scientists who are working on this will produce a solution that will help us safely leave our homes. And I, that is a priority for, for my son and I think for all of our loved ones, not only for us, but all the paraprofessionals who are not working here and are furloughed, if we can get their, them antibody tests, they can come back into our homes. They can start ramping up and it's an economic issue, not just a health issue. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you, Carrie. And we, uh, I did bring that to Leo so we could put it in our next letter. Um, I think we're trying to prioritize what goes out to the secretary and what goes out to DDS um, kind of by what flame is going currently. But I think that is that is hugely important. And if there is capacity to do tighter testing, it will be amazing for group homes and for in-home in home health. Um, so it's on my list. I also have on my list the, the triage officer um, and to look into the guardianship piece um, around people who are in the process. Okay, thank you. Um, I know Christine did a comment that she would advise, um, I believe it was Nancy who had um, the question about guardianship. Um, there, there are temporary guard processes for crisis. So um, courts may be processing this um, remotely. Um, Nancy had a comment or, the, or a question. Are there any hospitals in Massachusetts so far that have been identified on showing discrimination against those with disabilities being admitted? Yeah, not that we have heard, um, you know, it certainly could be happening. Um, but at this point, I don't think anyone is over capacity. I think we're preparing for that. Um, I know, you know, they're starting, obviously all of the hospitals are, are taking over space in other areas besides the ICU to accommodate. But as far as I know, um, you know, there hasn't been that need at this point. It's the next couple weeks, three weeks, four weeks where we're worried. So this is like incredibly timely, important that this guidance gets shifted and that we are able to really communicate it and blow it up in the media a bit um, so that um, everyone is aware. Okay, thank you. And let's see, Lucy had a question about what, what the ARC's position is on the waivers of the MCAS. Um, and she's, she feels that a waiver would let schools out of the, off the hook for lack of appropriate educational services. 
That's a great question. So I don't exactly know um, enough about what the bill is right now, whether it actually waives the MCAS completely or um, specifically what it will do, but I can definitely get an answer for that and, and send that out to you. And I know Kath Kathleen Amaral um, is working kind of closer on the education issues, so I can reach out to her as well. Okay, and uh, Rebecca, uh, share that the Guardianship Academy has a website and there's an Ask the Expert portal where questions can be submitted. They have information about which courts are conducting what type of hearings and procedures. So she gave that link. You can see it in the chat box. Thank you, that's great. Yeah, and then Nancy said, can we receive guidance, recommendation, the ARC is sending off on all of these issues? Yes, um, so you can check out, I think I put a link, but you can check out our, our ARC COVID updates page. If you scroll down, there's categories you can click on. Healthcare, if you click on the healthcare, you'll see the letters that have gone out already. And then when we have this letter done, which it's close, um, probably by the end of today, we will post that as well. And anything, pretty much anything we do, we're being fully transparent and we get it up there on our website as soon as possible. Okay, thanks. And let's see, uh, Melissa has a question. Is there anybody else we should connect with aside from our legislators? Hmm, uh, that's a great question. Um, what do you think, Carrie? Is there anyone else outside of legislature that could be helping here? I mean, any private organizations that can donate to nonprofits at this time? Um, you know, I, I, I think it's hard to get these private organizations to understand at this point in time the need. And um, yep. all of us are, are going to be needing, um, you know, to get back on our feet. So. I don't know. What do you think, Carrie? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a great point. Um, you know, I think that what I hear from the disability community is that um, you know, definitely the PPE uh, equipment supplies so so important. So, um, if I, you know, I know of private businesses that have been, um, you know, donating to hospitals and. Uh, you know, disability agencies and that sort of thing. Um, I just got off the phone call with the uh, family support providers of the affiliates of the ARC, and they were talking about how many people are really needing access to um, groceries and um, fund money. So uh, there was a, a donation to one of the affiliates of $1,000 and then went out and got uh, gift cards to grocery shop. So I think um, basic needs right now are a huge, huge issue. But yeah, so guess, um, let's see. Carrie, I would say one other uh, thing, maybe just um, as as this moves forward, if you have any media contacts, um, that's a great way to reach out. Letter to the editor at the Globe. Um, you know, a lot of things have been popping up that are very disability related, but anytime we can get letters to the editor out, um, it, it makes an impact. Good point. And uh, Beth was just sharing that another perspective on waiving the MCAS, um, her, okay. her daughter's IEP calls for some extra MCAS prep, which is not as robust right now. So she would be hurt by being forced to take the MCAS this spring. Um, Justin uh, has a question. I have his application into to DBS to qualify in general. Does that make sense to contact them, read, read this? Yeah, absolutely. I'd say a lot of things are actually getting expedited right now. Um, so why not? Okay, thank you. And Nancy uh, suggests that encourage parents to make sure they're letting DDS know their specific needs so they will have documentation to help them advocate as well. Absolutely. Yeah, how about anybody else? Anybody else have any questions? I think we're running out of time here. I want to be respectful of everyone's uh, time crunch. So just chat them in and we can maybe take one more.
Thank you, everybody. All right. Okay. Well, thank you. And thanks, Maura, for a, a good update on, on what's going on in Massachusetts. So, thank all you. right. We'll see you next okay, week. Okay. Thank you, Thanks everyone. Everybody.